must have tackled, you know, ultimately, if you feel differently, you can know, say short up the span and really reduce the fold height slightly, but you will increase the number of folds, so sort of the balance again. Uh, we've included the longer spans in the application. Uh, and just some of these are, are follow ups to what the Board of Adjustments asked for, but we felt that it would be prudent for us to, to deliver on, on those items. So uh, there's a, a state code, 5414-202, and uh, it, it allows a local jurisdiction to ask for uh, study for an underground line. And uh, we've gone and collected that with a third-party engineering firm, NEI. Um, they actually specialize in underground lines. They, they did one with a similar utility um, up in Wyoming uh, just, just prior to doing the study. Just a, a, a couple points to go through. So, uh, and this is the third bullet point. Students allowed by state law as conditions of approval or any portion uh, within the city to construct underground as long as the applicant's technical requirements are met. It's got to meet our standards. And uh, subject to the city paying the difference between the standard and excess costs. So, standard cost is, is current, it's building it per current standard. So, it's for the overhead standard meeting the latest NESC requirements. So uh, the, the code stated there, and this was the result. Um, and, and there's various segments, if you don't mind advancing to the next slide. Uh, we, we, we did the entire line, it went, it went from all the way north of the county over through Midway as well. And so we've included sections that are applicable to Heber City. But uh, in, in the north field, uh, I think the cost was about four, four to one. So um, it's a little more than this, but it, uh, curiously, it's about a million miles, a little over a million miles for overhead. And so you'd be looking at the excess cost and something in the range of the three, three and a half million per mile uh, to pay for that. And then this, the same thing through North Hills to South Hills and uh, single circuit to the substation. So, you know, it, it's a substantive cost, but we. You, know, you have that right, we wanted to provide you information on that. Uh, go ahead and advance to the next slide. One of the, one of the questions that was asked was coordination amongst municipalities and jurisdictions. And, and if I recall, there's been a couple of a year and a half. Um, I think some of it was, was an intent to try to understand what the, what the county was doing and, and time that was city didn't have an ordinance, but what, what the other jurisdictions were doing, um, you, you know, we're, we're held to follow what the ordinance says. Uh, we, we, don't, um, we can report on, on what, uh, what we're hearing from the county. As far as, as outside of local jurisdictions, uh, I've been this before, we've coordinated with the T Mountain Association of Governments uh, through uh, sections that, that are applicable within wetland delineations. Uh, those delineations were accepted by the Corps of Engineers and we submitted a product development, which was also approved by the Corps of Engineers. Uh, so we, we have uh, been diligently working and have obtained approvals uh, to move forward and we're working on local governments. Um, and at this point, we, we believe we have obtained all known uh, required approval for the state law for this project. I think that that covers the items that uh, we were asked to report on at the board of adjustments as well. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, did you, does anybody want to ask us some questions now before we open up the public hearing, or did you want to reserve those questions after the public hearing? Okay, we're going to uh, retain the option to ask questions after the public has voiced their opinions. So, with that, thank you for the presentation. Appreciate that. We're going to open up the public hearing. Anybody that has a comment to make, come up to the podium here, state your name, your comment, and we ask that we limit those. Um, we've got quite a few here, so we want to make sure that. Everybody has an opportunity to voice their opinion, and uh, so don't don't take up the whole entire meeting tonight with your opinion. But.
try to reserve that to as few minutes as possible, three or, or four if you can. And uh, please let's not have any outbursts, no applauding, no booing. Um, we're all adults here and we can get along reasonably. So, so thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm David George. I live at 650 West and uh, 1440 South. So technically I'm not in the city, but I'm right in the city limit and I'm pretty heavily impacted by this. In fact, I think I'd say I'm the most in affected person on the entire power line route. So if Tony could pull up the uh, uh, last uh, uh, plot that shows, yeah, the one with, the, yep, that's it right there. So, so the, the real issue, it's very simple actually. So Hebrew Light Power acquired the Riley Probst property for 2.1 million and they intend to build a substation on that. So that's not really your problem, that's my problem and the county's problem. But to get to that, they've now cited this power line, which goes to, this is my property line right here. And as Tony knows, there's been a dispute over where this bypass road is going to go. And it's actually a pretty serious dispute for me. Because by putting it on the east side, there's, a, there's an easement, a limited easement for the bypass road. If you put the power lines, that's an empty lot right now. I'm sure there, I, I know there are people here that have plans to develop this. But so, if you put the power line on the east side, that's going to basically either squeeze this bypass road into a very narrow site, or you're going to have to try to acquire land from me, which I can tell you I'm not at all predisposed to do for good reasons. Uh, so we have a we have kind of a squeeze, you know, basically you can get my land because of the siting of this power line, or we got to negotiate with other owners who are for undeveloped land to change the site. Now there's a way out of this, okay? And the way out of this is for this section from 113 to 650 south, and maybe down to the Provo River. If that were buried, it would solve a lot of problems because you could do this on county and city land. Yes, it would cost more money, but it would free you up from some land. You, the reason they moved the substation from the Hebrew Creeper area is because they didn't want the visual impact of the substation. They were a tourist attraction. So, so I get it in my backyard, but I'm not as many visitors as the Hebrew Creeper. So, uh, but you know, it would go a long way. So once you make a decision for visual reasons you're going to move a substation, I think the city really ought to carry through in the county. And they actually ought to bury this land so this big eyesore, and that's what it is, uh, is not marching across the ballpark view uh, across uh, Southfield Road. So it's really quite simple. I mean, uh, we could argue forever on you know, whether the substation, which I believe is substantially larger than the original one, so I suspect that you're going to get that the other applications to extend power lines to the south, but that's again not your problem. So that's really my uh, that's really my comment on the whole thing is to is be uh, careful about where this thing is sited, not just for the short term convenience and kick the can down the road, but I think the bypass road has to be properly considered. And I've made my statement a couple of years ago on this that I'm not willing to uh, give easements to land. It would have to be a complete separate negotiation. So we kind of put the people into a squeeze on it. So thank you very much for your time. By the way, I will send a, a list of, I can write it to the mayor, and I will send you a list um, of what I am proposing to the county as mitigation steps, because that's what this whole CUP is about. What sort of reasonable mitigation steps should we take? And I've got a long list of these, and of course it's not like the Chinese menu, you can't just pick some, I think it has to be holistically done, so that the all kind of mesh together to minimize the impact to this really unique section of that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. George. Um, can, can you guys show everybody where that sub substation is proposed to go? Yeah. Probably easier to show on Google or
10 acres to be fenced, um, and a little bit smaller than that than the fence for the substation side. And we bought 20 acres if you only need 10. You deserve 20 for sale. <laughs> <laughs> discussion. 
discussions at some of the other meetings where some of the landowners along the route have said they would absolutely uh, give an easement uh, at no cost if the line was buried, but that if it's above ground, they will be very difficult as far as a negotiation. So I just think it's important that everybody understands that while we're hearing a four to one uh, differential between above ground versus underground, the cost, as I understand it, does not include the cost of the easements. And that's a very important element to the total cost. And if I have that incorrect, please feel free to correct me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Who wants to address that, Mr. Clay or Mr. Rosa? As far as the easement acquisition, we probably can't uh, get to do that because we might have permitted then without that. But as far as the budgeting cost goes, we have to budget the same whether there's an underground or an overhead easement. Um, to this day, no one has came to me specifically and offered free easements uh, at this point. Uh, so we have to plan that we would have to pay for all of the easements. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess I would, I would probably just add that you know, other jurisdictions within this county, we've been instructed and, and advised uh, in public hearings to not want to collect these things prior to having a permit. Um, and so uh, on this line, as, as you are aware, uh, for sections, we are following existing alignments, and the easement needs on those existing alignments are going to be very different than if there are no easements. Um, but even if you ran a, a financial model on the assumption that the easements were free for underground, the, the overhead cost per acre would have to be something. There's, there's not any land in, the, in Utah that's worth the amount of money it would have to be worth per acre to, uh, to overcome the cost of the line. So uh, I, I, I agree and, and um, we'll uh, agree that, that the easement costs are not included in the, the actual facility estimate that was provided, but the, the cost is, is so negligible that it really won't drive the needle out. Okay, thank you. All right. Mr. Allen, do you want to come on up here, please? Did you have his name, please? No. Um, who, who else wants to come up to the podium and make a comment? Mike Johnson, Keeper City. I actually have a question just to clarify. So did I hear Harold say that the city has the option to underground any of this green line at the city's cost? The difference. The difference. So if we, we, we want to pick the park willing past, say, Country Meadow Estates and say we'd like to underground that portion. That's our, that's the city's prerogative to, to do that. Is that what you said? Yes, yeah, so previously. Yeah. Tracy Taylor, Heber City. Um, I think in these public hearings, it, it since we most of us are Heber Light Power ratepayers, and this is a Heber City meeting, it would be good to know. You know, who's on our Heber Light and Power Board? I understand we have a representative here from Heber Light and Power, but Mayor Clean Potter is the chair of the board, and we've got two Heber City Council people sitting on this Heber Light and Power Board, which is Wayne Hardman and Jeff Smith. And then we have Kendall Crittenden from the county, we have the mayor of, of Midway and Celeste Johnson, and we also have the Mayor of Charleston, Brenda, um, but we we've heard about this facilities committee over at the county meeting as well, and I think it's only fair that we know who are on these, who's on this facilities committee, and that they should be here answering some questions for the public because they're the ones that did the research, made the recommendations to the Everlight Power Board, 
And so, you know, Her Harold's here in good faith, but he wasn't in those meetings. And so, you know, I'd like to know who's on this facilities committee, because that was never disclosed at the county meeting. And then they should be here at the next public hearing to answer these direct questions. There was some questions at the county meeting that talked about the cost for bearing the lines over um, the above ground and what that was going to cost. We'd like to hear more about that analysis that was done. And then also, a year and a half ago, the Planning Commission had asked for alternative routes. Show us some alternative routes. And that was brought up last week at the county meeting, and that was never done. All we heard was the facilities committee looked at alternative routes and nothing was worthy of bringing to the public. Or did they bring it to the Heberlite Power Board to vote on and to discuss? We don't know this kind of process, and I think it's only fair that the people on the facilities committee are here to answer some of these questions because they were in all those meetings. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Did you attend those meetings, you, Mr. Olson? Yes. Oh, you were there. Okay. Uh, facilities Committee for Heat Ride and Power is made up of Mayor Celeste Johnson of Midway, Councilman Wayne Hartman of Heber, and County Councilman Kendall Creek. Just those three on the facilities committee? Yes. <coughs> okay. My name is Wayne Casey. I'm actually a resident of the county but a resident of the South Field. So first I want to say I'm grateful every day that I have power. And Harold has been out to my house before and replaced the pole, and they do a great job, so I am very appreciative of that. But as a resident of the South Fields, um, having these, uh, you know, a huge substation and large power lines is kind of um, pouring salt in the wounds of those of us that have been battling this bypass in the South Fields. And, um, and so I am encouraging uh, uh, the powers that be to bury these lines. Also, um, because I am a photographer, and um, some of you on uh, the commission have seen my work, and um, it's becoming increasingly more difficult to edit out power poles. And uh, from a beautification point and the aesthetic point of, the, of this gorgeous valley that people come, tourists come to see and visit and stay. Um, they don't want to look at these massive power poles going right through the center of the valley. I shoot a lot in the north fields and I shoot a lot of Timpanogos. And um, those go out, you know, virally all over on Instagram and social media and they see this beautiful valley <coughs> that we live in. And, and you know, with uh, Envision Heber, you know, 2050, they want, you know, it's the goal to create a, in, uh, to create a, um, a beautiful downtown uh, Heber city. And, and um, do we want large power poles and a substation right there that right in the middle of the valley um, so I'm asking that you kind of keep in mind those things as well. We want to keep our beautiful valley, our open space. Um, there are a lot of photographers that live here and, and take phenomenal pictures of taking notice in the valley. And um, uh, anyway, I'm encouraging you to consider just burying those lines. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening, I'm Brad Bishop. I'm uh, the other owner um, on the uh, green line from 316 to 320. Uh, Mr. Bluth uh, already pointed out that those that line would go over 15 lots and maybe just to get some economic uh, impact that would, to us that would be about two to $2.5 million worth of building lots to us. So that would be a pretty big hit for, for our project. So, thank you. <coughs> okay. Anybody else?
Would, would you care if I made a final summary statement? I don't. I think we got somebody. Oh, else. you got somebody coming. I'm sorry. We know that Heber City owns 75% of Heber Light and Power, and that's why we have three people on the Heber Light and Power Board. Um, as one of the elected officials of Heber City, I'm very frustrated at this entire contract with Rocky Mountain Power. I don't doubt the need for power, and my father helped, was actually the supervisor that built the Provo Line back in the 80s, and he retired from Rocky Mountain Power. So. Certainly, I understand what it's like to have a father work in that all of his life. But um, the actual contract, and this is again just a big picture. I'm just trying to paint some history and a big picture here for you. Um, this actual contract with Rocky Mountain Power was never publicized for anyone to look at before it was signed. It was talked about in the Heber Light and Power Board meetings, but it was never published online for anyone in the public, least of all the rest of the Heber City Council to look at before it was approved and signed and sealed and delivered with Rocky Mountain Power. That is really frustrating to me that as an elected official, we didn't have any say, the rest of the Heber City Council, the majority of the Heber City Council had no say over that contract with Rocky Mountain Power. So that's one real big historical concern I have. I would just ask you a this. quick question. Are the minutes made public after, I mean, there was a video, but the minutes never showed the contract. The contract never became public until after it was signed. And that is very frustrating, because I feel like if this whole discussion had happened before it was signed with Rocky Mountain Power, that people would not be so frustrated right now with what about the water was cold, where is it going. We didn't have that discussion in the first place. And I have stood for five and a half years now on transparency and accountability to the citizens. And I feel like this whole contract just totally avoided that transparency and accountability. Okay, my second concern about this whole route and the lines is that we have been told by UDOT as of just the last month or so that that bypass route is not guaranteed. This route that they're asking for, that they're hoping would be by the bypass road, it's not guaranteed anymore. UDOT will not commit, commit to any bypass route that has been planned for in the past, they are only saying that we have to wait three to four years until that environmental study is done before UDOT will come back and say, hey, this is the best route. So when you're looking at approving you know, the parts that are within the city and then the other parts that the county will have to look at, just realize that there is no guarantee whatsoever that this route could be on the east side, down the middle, anywhere in what that future bypass route would be. Uh, I wish we could pin you out down, but that's a great concern to me. It's a huge concern to me that we're going to have potentially these huge power lines out by themselves in the fields, right, with no bypass road around them, and, and who knows where that bypass road could be too. <coughs> I feel like there are environmental impacts, especially in the 